North Vietnam, the heart of enemy territory, had evolved into a fortress ringed by the latest Soviet weaponry. SA-2 surface-to-air missiles lined common flying routes and protected air bases, supply lines, and city centers. All too often, the weapons proved to be deadly accurate. The only way to stop the SA-2s was to lure them out and hopefully escape before they claimed another life. It was a mission that took skill, instinct, and guts of steel. The planes and pilots who dared to carry out this cat-and-mouse tactic were called the Wild Weasels. American planes and pilots were engaged in a massive bombing campaign against North Vietnam called Rolling Thunder. The operation required F-105 fighter bombers to strike increasingly deeper into enemy territory. Carrying payloads of 500-pound iron bombs, the planes went after the communist war-making capability Bridges, refineries, and rail yards were just a few of the strike fighters' targets. Initially, the U.S. air crews easily defeated the relatively primitive North Vietnamese air defense network. Other than a few radar-directed anti-aircraft guns, the most threatening air defenses came from the Viet Cong. They fired everything from Russian AK-47s to muskets to handguns. However, as rolling thunder progressed, the North Vietnamese realized the need for better air defenses. Soon, greater numbers of big anti-aircraft guns, ranging from 57 up to 120 millimeter, began to arrive from the Soviet Union. And finally, in the spring of 1965, the Soviet-built SA-2 surface-to-air missile showed up in the port of Haiphong. This two-stage radar-controlled rocket could travel at three times the speed of sound. Weighing as much as an SUV and measuring up to 35 feet long, the missile aptly earned the nickname the Flying Telephone Pole. It was also controllable. The SAM could be rigged to explode at a specific altitude or within range of a certain aircraft. If a pilot was unaware that a SAM had launched, and if the radar trackers could keep the plane in their radar beam, the missile would strike with devastating accuracy. On July 21st, 1965, an American jet came face to face with the SAM's capability. The first plane was lost, followed by eight more in less than four months. Something had to be done. Immediately, a top secret program called Wild Weasel was launched. The plan called for F-100Fs to be outfitted with the latest radar homing and warning gear. To test the new weapon, five volunteer flight crews were hand-picked from among the Air Force's best F-100 pilots and electronic warfare officers, or EWOs. Major Gary Willard was in charge of their training. It seemed rather funny to us at the time that uh, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force came down to talk to us, and uh, as did Secretary of the Air Force Brown. Uh, we knew then that we had a pretty important mission. 
but not, uh, we didn't know exactly what we are getting into. There was no time to lose. Within a month, the weasels, as the new planes and crews were called, were bound for some real world testing in Southeast Asia. The men were briefed that the strike forces were taking a beating. If US planes weren't taken out by SAMs, then they were at least forced down into the range of some of the most deadly anti-aircraft barrages in history. The weasels jumped into action. On November 21, 1965, Major Willard, leading a covert flight of four, met up with a squadron of F-105s heading to Korat Air Base in Thailand. We were all top secret. I mean, it was so secret that when we joined up with the 105s uh, over the coast of California, we took uh, uh, 20 airplanes into Hawaii, and they never knew we were there until we landed. So what are you guys doing here? The overhauled planes were packed with a series of electronic sensors. With these, the electronic weapons officer, or BEAR, could find the type and direction of enemy radar. If he wasn't able to find the SAM from its radar signature, there was an experimental warning receiver built in to warn of a SAM launch. But the ultimate goal of this warning capability, to ride the radar beams to their source so that the weasels could kill before being killed. I can remember Bill Cooper, who lost his life in uh, Vietnam to a SAM. He said, Gary, you're gonna do what? With what? To whom? SAM suppression flights fell under the code name Iron Hand. Generally, the weasels preferred to fly ahead of the strike force to allow more time for identifying and hopefully destroying potential threats. Essentially, they were sent in to act as bodyguards to the strike force, a job that put them directly in the line of fire. On December 20th, the weasels learned firsthand just how dangerous their job was. Two crews, led by John Pitchford and Bob Trier, were flying in typical formation ahead of a strike force of F-105s. 30 miles northwest of Hanoi, they picked up several enemy radar signals simultaneously there was no time to react. Pitchford and Trier's plane was hit. Almost immediately, the hydraulics began to fail, and their F-100 nosed into an uncontrollable dive. While both men were able to bail out after considerable difficulty, they were immediately confronted by North Vietnamese militia upon landing. John and Bob didn't come back. John re was a prisoner of war for over seven years. Bob Trier, unfortunately, uh, what, what we have been able to piece together was killed uh, trying to escape capture. So uh, that was a really a bad day. From that day forward, the weasels changed their tactics. To mask their movements, they decided to fly as low as possible just above treetop level. Just two days later, during a strike against the rail yard located on the notorious Red River, this tactic was put to the test. As soon as the lead weasel crew crossed into North Vietnam, they identified a SAM radar signal that was apparently searching for their flight. The crew immediately dove to mask their position. Periodically, the crew popped up from behind the hills to fix a new bearing on the enemy signal. Soon, a second SAM radar was identified, while the first had locked onto and was tracking their aircraft. The pilot approached a tiny village where he discovered a well-camouflaged radar control van and three missiles. The crew unleashed a barrage of 2.75-inch rockets and then strafed the village with 20-millimeter cannon fire the pilot could see the North Vietnamese troops scattering from the site. The 20 millimeter walked right into one of the SAMs, causing a large explosion. With smoke billowing from the site, the rest of the flight struck with tremendous force, repeatedly unleashing barrages of rockets and cannon fire until the site had been destroyed and the radar signal was off the air. <laughs> 
While the other SAM site furiously searched for the strike force, the weasels led the 105s down behind a hill and sped from the area. The mission had worked exactly as intended. The following day, the 7th Air Force publicized destruction of the SAM site to the world, but there was no mention of the wild weasels. Instead, the F-105s were credited with the kill. The project was still so secret that no one outside of the Pentagon and the men back at base knew about this new and unusual strike force. That was really the, the beginning of the, of the wild weasel program, and the, uh, it demonstrated that, yes, we could find them and destroy them. A secret program called the Wild Weasels, intended to counter surface-to-air missiles, has been deemed a success. But its fate is still uncertain. Two problems continue to plague the fledgling project. One was the speed of its aircraft, F-100. They were much slower than the F-105s they were supposed to protect. This forced the F-105s to fly at much slower speeds on approach to the target area posing unnecessary risks to the strike pilots. This also meant that the slower weasels were often left to fend for themselves on the way in and out of the target area. As soon as we came off the target, I noticed that we were alone, of course, because the 105s, the only thing we could see was them disappearing in the distance heading south. So that, there about came that expression, first in, last out had nothing to do with anything amounting to a great amount of courage. It just was that we didn't have enough uh, ghost stuff in our airplane to, to keep up with the 105s. Another problem had to do with the weasel's ordnance load. They just couldn't carry as much as the F-105s. While both carried 20-millimeter rounds and rockets, the 105s also carried conventional bombs. Also, to destroy the targets with their particular payload, the weasels had to head straight into the SAM site at an extremely low altitude. This put the airmen well within range of anti-aircraft and even small arms fire. In March of 66, the danger became a reality. A second weasel crew was downed and both men killed when their plane was struck from below. The loss served as a lesson to test new ordnance configurations. Cluster bomb units proved to be among the most promising for suppressing anti-aircraft fire and triggering explosions in the missiles. Each bomblet detonated just above the ground, sending thousands of steel pellets throughout the site. In addition to conventional bombs carried by the 105s, the weasels also tried dropping napalm canisters. However, the large tanks also required a low release altitude and created considerable drag on the already slow F-100s. In March of 1966, the Air Force found a solution. They replaced the plane. A new version of the F-105F would take over the Weasel mission and it would carry a new missile, the radar-seeking AGM-45 Shrike. The arrival of these specially configured two-seat 105s finally provided the Weasels with the speed needed to keep pace with strike aircraft and to evade enemy threats when necessary. However, it was the Shrike that had the biggest impact on the Weasel's ability to suppress SAMs. We saw a big change in the, uh, in the way the radar operators on the ground, the uh, North Vietnamese and their Russian advisors, when, they would, when we would launch that Shrike, the radars would go down. When the radars went down, of course, that's when they'd lose their ability to, to launch the missile accurately. The Shrike was being developed as early as 1958 to counter the emerging threat posed by Soviet SAMs. The missile was rushed into service after a U-2 reconnaissance plane became the first confirmed victim by an SA-2 during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. During a typical mission, the Weasels and all other strike aircraft joined up with a KC-135 tanker almost immediately after takeoff. The 105s were notorious fuel guzzlers, 
especially during combat operations, when pilots frequently employed their afterburners. As a result, it was critical for crews to take on the maximum amount of fuel possible before heading north. Once refueled, the weasels moved out ahead of the flight, usually in a Y formation, with the strike aircraft trailing in the middle and some distance behind. For the duration of the mission, the safety of the entire flight rested in the hands of the Electronic Warfare Officers, or BEARS. The real key to the weasel mission is the guy in the back seat, or the bear. The bear has been trained to understand and to operate in an electronic environment. Um, he knows the signals, he knows how to uh, identify and to react to the signals, which ones are good and which ones are bad, which ones are going to hurt us. Uh, he's very proficient in the use of the weapons, even though he didn't actually fire the weapons themselves, but that's irrelevant. He could say, shoot. In addition to monitoring radar threats on various scopes, the bear listened intently to hundreds of strange signals emitted by North Vietnamese radars. To his trained ear, each sound was quite distinct and contributed to a mental image of how radar operators on the ground were responding to the incoming strike force. It would have been impossible for the pilot alone to effectively digest the dense signal patterns over North Vietnam, but the bear could focus solely on pinpointing the location of enemy threats, instantly assign a priority to them, and recommend a course of action. We had uh, essentially a receiver that picked up the frequency of the SAM radar. We turned in the direction. We had needles that told us that we were going straight into it. And at that time, we didn't have missiles that could go around the corner to hit the site. We had the Shrikes, which had to go straight in. And uh, once we lined up, we thought we had a kill, we fired the Shrike. The Shrike had a range of 5 to 10 miles and was designed to destroy the radar control antennae by riding the signal beam back to its source. When the missile struck, its warhead scattered 23,000 steel fragments throughout the target. There was one hitch, though, with this anti-radiation missile. If the enemy radar signal shut down before impact, the Shrike's guidance system was rendered useless, and the weapon would miss its target. In addition, the missile had a relatively small warhead. As a result, Weasel crews and the 105s that accompanied them frequently struck sites with conventional bomb loads after a Shrike hit just to make sure that the site was destroyed. Among the conventional weapons favored by weasel crews were cluster bombs. The dispersion pattern of the bomblets and the steel pellets that they emitted allowed the weasels to saturate a relatively large site. These cluster bombs would go out and hopefully hit some of the missiles and cause explosions in the missiles and cause explosions in the fuel vans and the other kinds of things. So you could blow the site up. That was the reliable way of tearing down a site, is go in there with the bombs and blow the site up. The Shrike's function was to hit the radar antenna and shut the radar down. Maybe the Shrike would get into the radar van, but you wouldn't do damage to the rest of the site. By mid-1966, they had figured out an effective way to destroy the SAM sites before they launched. In the meantime, the threats had multiplied. There were far too many for the weasels to take on individually. As a result, they simply tried to position themselves far enough out in front of the flight to act as a decoy for the missiles that were launched. To many strike pilots, this seemed like an admirable but somewhat suicidal goal. I felt the weasels had the advantage because we knew where they were coming from and we were expecting them. We were the decoys. So it was our job to invite them up to shoot at us and then get the hell out of the way. Weasel crews learned early on that they could evade oncoming SAMs in a high stakes game of chicken, provided that they could actually see the missile. The bear immediately knew when a missile had launched. He and the pilot would then frantically search below for signs of a large dust cloud or for a smoke trail left in the rocket's supersonic wake. Once the missile was in sight, the pilot began evasive procedures. 
missile was coming up. You start down, and then as the missile got closer, you would then start up again and start like what we call the yo-yo, up and down, up and down. And the missile would then get out of sequence with you, and pretty soon it couldn't track you anymore. It just didn't have that capability because it was going so fast, it was so heavy, and had a limited uh, guidance capability. Debris from SAMs that missed their targets, and even those that struck, often landed among civilian populations. This led to cries of American bombing atrocities by the North Vietnamese government. Teamwork was critical to the success and survival of Wild Weasel crews. The slightest bit of strife between the pilot and his backseater could ultimately pose a threat to an entire strike force. This guy and this pilot had to live in harmony. You know, they, just, they could not afford for these two guys to be uh, bickering at each other. We tried to find out which guys really gravitated toward each other. We normally found out about that at the bar. The pilots and their backseaters were allowed to pair up into teams based on their own preferences. From that point forward, the crews lived, ate, socialized, slept, and trained together in order to develop close bonds. Trust between the bear and the pilot was the single most important element of their relationship. Many backseaters had never set foot in a high-performance jet fighter, let alone one that was threatened in combat. And many of the pilots had never flown with or wanted to fly with a backseater. In fact, many opposed the idea at first, but there was simply no choice in the matter. Weasel missions required the skill and attention of both men. We had a hot mic, so we could hear each other breathing. And whenever one of us had something to say, we, we talked. And there were crews, some crews that were <laughs> talking constantly, so much so that when I flew with some of the guys that were big talkers, I asked them to just cut it. But my pilot and I, for whatever the reasons were, we were good friends, we understood each other, we were able to speak to each other. The reactions between the two of us, the interaction between the two of us was perfect. I mean, we survived. And I think that was the reason for having uh, guys team up so they could learn to understand and know each other. And that was one of the keys to survival in the weasel business is that you and the pilot kind of worked as one guy rather than as two separate individuals. The crew's ability to anticipate each other's thoughts became critical when entering high threat areas. The radios were often jammed with excited calls from other members of the flight. This, coupled with the endless array of audio signals emanating from enemy radars and other electronics, meant that communication had to be precise. We're getting flat the target one, watch it. As a result, Weasel crews often communicated with grunts and one-liners. Even in dead silence, some crews felt that they could still communicate. The Weasel's motto, first in, last out, did originate from the mismatch in airspeed between the slower F-100s and the F-105s that they escorted. However, the motto took on a whole new significance after 1966, when the Weasels received their own 105s. Rather than changing their tactics, the crews continued to practice this strategy out of necessity and out of a sincere desire to provide strike crews with adequate protection. As the first in, last out says, we're in there looking for the threats. Hopefully we can kill them or get them, get them to put their heads down or do whatever 
while the strike force comes in behind us. So we did lead the force in. And then when they left, yeah, we were hanging around to make sure nobody got them on the way out. OK, this is Banjo. I've got a contact down in the target area. Pull up about 10 degrees and try to punch. Well, let me see. Get me lined up. OK, keep turning left. OK. A little out now. He's strong. All right, punch. He's going to get strong in a minute. OK, I got him. Now, you got to pull up. Now, you got to pull up. Strong. And one, six, and down. Six, and down. Okay. Right. Is this Banjo? Yeah. We just had a launch. Take it down, Chris. Which way now? They got the launch. 11 o'clock. We can take it down. Roger, Banjo, take it down. Uh, we got a launch. We're going to get up off the van at 12 o'clock. I think we're all right with the time, Ben. Putting it off looks good. OK, Detroit, uh, let's get out of here to the southwest. Sams and Flack were not the only threat that the Weasels had to contend with. There was also the ever-present threat of Soviet-built MiGs. were forced to tangle with MiGs periodically. On April 19, 1967, Major Leo Thorsness and his bear, Captain Harold Johnson, became the first to down one of the Soviet planes. More victories would follow, along with several losses. The mission usually ended much as it began, with the strike force and then the weasels returning to the tankers. Refueling was so routine that time spent gassing up became a much needed quiet moment for the crews to reflect. And it was about that time that when we hit the tanker that I would think about the mission because during the mission everything is instinctive. You know, it's all calculated. You know what you're going to do, you know what you have to do. Wild weasels hunted down and killed 89 SAM sites and prevented hundreds more from launching during the Rolling Thunder campaign over North Vietnam. Their success came with a high cost. 42 American airmen missing, killed, or captured, and more than a couple of dozen aircraft downed. Among them were five of the first F-105s within a few months of their introduction. The mission was so dangerous, it was nearly impossible for Weasel crews to complete the 100 flights necessary to fulfill their tour and return home. The likelihood that they would be killed, captured, or wounded was so real that filling out dream sheets for their next tour was considered pointless. Still, there were men willing to carry out the Weasel mission. I don't feel that you can go into a job like this under pressures of feeling you're not going to survive. Because if you go into combat feeling you're not going to survive, you're going to die. You've got to go in basically feeling invincible. You've got to do it calculated. You don't take stupid risks. But you go in and know that you know what the hell you're doing. You're the best in your business, and you're going to survive. In an effort to control the number of losses, the Air Force ordered all 105s to carry at least one defensive missile and one electronic countermeasure pod that could jam enemy radars. The orders were not well received by the weasels. They complained that this would limit the number of shrikes they could carry. While the weasels were eventually exempted from the order, they did have to comply with a different set of restrictions that were more of a political nature. It was very frustrating in some respects uh, for example, we couldn't go after sites that were under construction because politically we weren't allowed to kill Soviets who may have been down there putting, helping putting these sites together. This was very frustrating. Within a year and a half, the North Vietnamese had quadrupled the number of SAM sites. In each of those sites, there were several hundred missiles ready to fire at any moment. Soon, weasel crews came to recognize the tactics of certain enemy radar operators at particular sites. Some airmen even jousted with individual operators who repeatedly turned their radar on and off 
as if teasing the weasels who were trying to pinpoint the well-camouflaged site. The sites definitely had personalities. They were mobile. You go up there one day and there was nobody home. The next day, there they were. They were very disciplined. Um, and they were pretty effective as they learned. And you got to remember, they were learning the weapon just as well as we were, learning our own weapons. We were in a whole new era of warfare. As time went on, they would learn, one, not to keep the radars up so long to give us alert time. They would try to get blasts and pick us up and then pass information to other sites. Uh, their tactic got better, and therefore we had to develop uh, newer tactics. Perhaps the most deadly tactic employed by North Vietnamese SAM operators was a scenario known as popcorn, or Dr. Pepper. Under this scheme, a weasel crew would identify a valid radar threat and begin their approach to strike, but would find that the radar had gone offline and that another site had come online nearby. The pilot would quickly adjust his azimuth to head for the new site, but as soon as he did, the second site would go down, and a third site would immediately come up and then go down. Suddenly, all three sites would come up simultaneously and launch from different directions at the baffled crew. This vastly complicated the pilot's evasive maneuvers and often resulted in deadly consequences for the weasels. The weasels developed a number of their own strategies for countering North Vietnamese radar tactics. One of the most effective was a modified version of an old bombing technique known as toss bombing. During this maneuver, weasel crews picked up as much speed as possible, pulled the nose up hard, and fired a strike or two out in front of the strike force. We had to fire at them within 10 miles, otherwise the strike would never reach there. So you'd dip the airplane's nose until you get the strike needles that are in the front seat lined up. And then from that, you estimate the range and how far you have to get nose up to launch it so that you could kind of lob the shrike to hit the site. The shrikes often arched over and homed in on an unsuspecting operator at one of the many radar sites that were searching for the incoming strike force. Timing and a little luck were critical in this maneuver. If the radar operators suspected that a shrike had been fired, they would immediately go off the air and the missile would just fall to the ground. This particular strategy had an unintended but beneficial side effect that became a favorite tactic for many weasel crews. Every time we dipped our nose, the SAMs went off the air because they knew they were going to get hit by the shrikes. So that, that was one of the tactics we developed, that we would periodically go in there if we thought a SAM was as soon as the SAM came on, dip the nose, and he would shut off, and the strike force would get in. I mean, the ultimate purpose was not to kill SAMs. The purpose was to get the strike force in there, drop their bombs, go after their targets, and get out safely. If we killed SAMs, that was fine. It was great. But if we got the strike force in and out, that was more important. While the strike was an advanced weapon for its day, its limited speed and turning capability had a negative impact on the weasel's ability to combat the SAM threat. The crew could try to destroy the SAM's ability to maintain a lock on its target by destroying the radar site from which it was launched. But this would almost surely be a losing battle. There was one big rule that you had to remember, that the SAM SA-2 had, was faster and had a lot longer range than a Shrike. So you couldn't try to outshoot them. The weasel's capabilities were further hampered by the limited range of the Shrike. North Vietnamese radar operators were keenly aware of this shortcoming and learned to capitalize on it by shutting down just before the weasels were in firing range. Once the radars were down, weasel crews had to resort to the difficult and dangerous job of searching for potential SAM threats visually. You look for different signs. You look for roads going into some place that doesn't make sense for a road to go in. You look for a buildup. You look for 
trucks or other kinds of buildings that don't look like they belong in a village. Or the, the hardest ones, of course, were the ones that were buried in those trees. We had trees down there, if I remember, about 300 feet high. These are huge. And uh, sometimes you wouldn't really see what you were looking for until you got down low enough to get hurt. The weasel's ability to actually destroy SAM installations took a gigantic leap forward in May of 1968 with the introduction of the AGM-78 standard anti-radiation missile. The standard was enormous for an air-launched missile. It was 15 feet long and weighed nearly 1,400 pounds, but it provided weasel crews with previously unheard of long-range capability. Working in conjunction with one of the 105's radar receivers, the standard could lock onto and strike enemy radars at a range of up to 60 miles. For the weasel crews, learning to use the new weapon was easy. There wasn't any tactic involved other than being there. You had, had to tote those things up. We were, we were, we were carriers, <clears throat> we were trucks. We carried them up, got a lock on, fired it. And then got a lock on the next one, fired it, and turned around and went home. We were done. The missile did all the work. As a matter of fact, if, the, if we had overshot the target and they were still transmitting, it could turn around underneath of us and go back and hit them behind us. So there, the Shrike re required you to get very close to the target, relatively close, it, and the standard, uh, we were miles away. I mean, they couldn't hear us, we couldn't hear them. All we knew was that they were operating. The standard's incredible range virtually negated the North Vietnamese tactic of shutting down radar sites to prevent missiles from homing in on the signal. Also, the large warhead would decimate the radar and the entire missile site. Once again, the Americans had a tool to destroy the latest Soviet technology. The air war over Vietnam had gone quiet by late 1968. A shift in the weasel mission was on the horizon. Slowly, weasel units were pulled back and deactivated as President Richard Nixon handed over more and more of the war effort to US trained South Vietnamese crews. By the end of April 1971, only one weasel squadron remained in Thailand. During the bombing halt, the weasels provided escort to reconnaissance flights to monitor North Vietnamese troop activities. Frequently, weasels were sent out to support and protect RF-4 Phantoms on these missions. What the U.S. planes observed was an increase in the flow of traffic on the notorious Ho Chi Minh Trail. It seemed that the North Vietnamese were using the bombing halt to stock up. An endless convoy of trucks bearing food, weapons, and ammunition streamed southward. The supplies were stockpiled in Laos and South Vietnam to support future offensives. As the flow of men and supplies increased, so too did the number of anti-aircraft threats. Within 18 months, enemy anti-aircraft defenses on the trail alone more than quadrupled. And further south, numerous SAM and radar-controlled anti-aircraft installations were put in place. The reconnaissance missions proved to be extremely difficult. The weasel crews could see firsthand what was transpiring below, but the bombing halt prevented them from doing anything more than observe. From our perspective, it was frustrating because we knew the guys sitting on the ground in South Vietnam were going to get hammered because our government was allowing these guys to bring the supplies down. So in that respect, all these bombing halts and all the political machinations that went on were very frustrating. Had they turned us loose, and this has been said many times before, to go after the targets as we were able to go after them without the constraints, political or otherwise, we could have shortened the war by years. 
Once the bombing halt was lifted, weasels were sent in with AC-130 Spectre gunships to stop the flow of supplies down the trail. Anti-aircraft and SAM sites posed the greatest threat to the large, slow-flying AC-130s. The threat was particularly heavy along the northern reaches of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, near the Laotian border with North Vietnam. By the end of 1971, North Vietnamese defenses threatened Spectre crews at every turn. Their anti-aircraft guns and missile batteries were located along the gunship's most commonly flown routes. When the weasels escorted the gunships, Spectre crews were able to focus more on their delicate sensors and less on the threat of SAMs from below. Without weasel protection, it's hard to say how successful the gunships would have been in destroying the supplies pouring down the trail. The next big roll for the wild weasels came after December 13, 1972, when the North Vietnamese government broke off all negotiations to end the war. President Nixon ordered an all-out bombing campaign against the North that came to be known as Linebacker II. During the campaign, weasel crews were assigned perhaps the most high-stakes mission of the war. They escorted the military's largest bomber, the slow-moving B-52, to the most heavily defended targets in North Vietnam, Hanoi and the port of Haiphong. Once there, the number of SAM sites proved to be too dense for even the weasels to penetrate. On December 20th, North Vietnamese air defense operators fired at least 220 SAMs at a flight of B-52s. Six were struck and went down in flames. Within two days, five more were down, killing some 120 crewmen. During subsequent raids, both the B-52s and their weasel escorts changed tactics. The B-52s began employing electronic countermeasures to jam SAM radars, while the weasels paired up with F-4s in hunter-killer team formations. Twice as many SAM sites were destroyed or suppressed, and no more B-52s were lost through the Christmas bombing halt. On December 26th, President Nixon ordered the largest bombing raid of the entire war. The change in tactics seemed to work. The missiles that launched tended to miss their targets, apparently because fearful SAM operators immediately turned off their radars to avoid attracting wild weasels. Colonel David Brog escorted flights of B-52s during raids against the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They would go in flights of three, and uh, our real concern, our primary concern, was to make sure that the SAMs wouldn't fire at the B-52s. But from a personal point of view, we were more concerned that we were out of the track of those B-52s, just in case they might have been off of their own track and drop area, because we figured anything worse or, than being hit by Sam coming up from the ground would be being hit by 104, 500 pound bombs coming down from the top. The Weasels and B-52s continued their new tactics during three smaller raids on Hanoi. Two more bombers were lost, but Sam operators were reportedly still firing salvos at the force without the aid of radar. On December 29th, President Nixon ordered a bombing halt above the 20th parallel. Four days later, the North Vietnamese government returned to the Paris peace talks and resumed negotiations in earnest. In the end, the weasel's suppression of the SAM sites played a role in the bombing campaign's success. As the war in Southeast Asia drew to a close, the next generation of weasel aircraft, the F-4C, was making its debut. By then, the probability that a weasel crew could survive until their 100th mission, and thus the end of their tour, had improved considerably. Nonetheless, 48 weasel crews were downed throughout the war. This was the price paid for the hundreds of SAM sites that were destroyed, 
and the thousands more that were forced off the air. But more importantly, it was the price paid for the hundreds of strike force pilots that were potentially saved. Ultimately, this relationship generated a strong sense of pride and camaraderie within the various weasel squadrons and with the men and planes of other units they protected. We, as the 44th TAC Fighter Squadron at Karat Air Base, Thailand, was the weasel squadron for that wing. We felt very strongly that we were protecting the guys in the 34th and the 469th on the missions that they were flying. And I think they felt the same way about us. They said, hey, these guys are in there protecting us and doing the job. So there, there was strong morale, esprit de corps. We had a lot of confidence in each other. The Wild Weasel mission remains an important component of U.S. air operations and will likely continue well into the future. For as long as there are manned aircraft flying offensive missions over ground-based defenses, there will always be a need for those daring enough to be first in, last out. the flying telephone pole. It was also controllable. The SAM could be rigged to explode at a specific altitude or within range of a certain aircraft. If a pilot was unaware that a SAM had launched, and if the radar trackers could keep the plane in their radar beam, the missile would strike with devastating accuracy. On July 21st, 1965, an American jet came face to face with the SAM's capability. The first plane was lost, followed by eight more in less than four months. Something had to be done. Immediately, a top secret program called Wild Weasel was launched. The plan called for F-100Fs to be outfitted with the latest radar homing and warning gear. To test the new weapon, five volunteer flight crews were hand-picked from among the Air Force's best F-100 pilots and electronic warfare officers, or EWOs. Major Gary Willard was in charge of their training. It seemed rather funny to us at the time that uh, the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force came down to talk to us. and. Uh, as did Secretary of the Air Force Brown. Uh, we knew then that we had a pretty important mission, but not, uh, we didn't know exactly what we were getting into. There was no time to lose. Within a month, the weasels, as the new planes and crews were called, were bound for some real world testing in Southeast Asia. The men were briefed that the strike forces were taking a beating. If U.S. planes weren't taken out by SAMs, then they were at least forced down into the range of some of the most deadly anti-aircraft barrages in history. The Weasels jumped into action. On November 21, 1965, Major Willard, leading a covert flight of four, met up with a squadron of F-105s heading to Korat Air Base in Thailand. We were all top secret. I mean, it was so secret that when we joined up with the 105s uh, over the coast of California, we took uh, uh, 20 airplanes into Hawaii, and they never knew we were there until we landed. So what are you guys doing here? The overhauled planes were packed with a series of electronic sensors. With these, the electronic weapons officer, or BEAR, could find the type and direction of enemy radar. If he wasn't able to find the SAM from its radar signature, there was an experimental warning receiver built in to warn of a SAM launch. But the ultimate goal of this warning capability, to ride the radar beams to their source so that the weasels could kill before being killed. <laughs> 
I can remember Bill Cooper, who lost his life in uh, Vietnam to a Sam. He said, Gary, you're gonna do what? With what? To whom? Sam's suppression flights fell under the code name Iron North Vietnam, the heart of enemy territory, had evolved into a fortress ringed by the latest Soviet weaponry. SA-2 surface-to-air missiles lined common flying routes and protected air bases, supply lines, and city centers. All too often, the weapons proved to be deadly accurate. The only way to stop the SA-2s was to lure them out and hopefully escape before they claimed another life. It was a mission that took skill, instinct, and guts of steel. The planes and pilots who dared to carry out this cat and mouse tactic were called the wild weasels. American planes and pilots were engaged in a massive bombing campaign against North Vietnam called Rolling Thunder. The operation required F-105 fighter bombers to strike increasingly deeper into enemy territory. Carrying payloads of 500-pound iron bombs, the planes went after the communist war-making capability Bridges, refineries, and rail yards were just a few of the strike fighters' targets. Initially, the U.S. air crews easily defeated the relatively primitive North Vietnamese air defense network. Other than a few radar-directed anti-aircraft guns, the most threatening air defenses came from the Viet Cong. They fired everything from Russian AK-47s to muskets to handguns. However, as rolling thunder progressed, the North Vietnamese realized the need for better air defenses. Soon, greater numbers of big anti-aircraft guns, ranging from 57 up to 120 millimeter, began to arrive from the Soviet Union. And finally, in the spring of 1965, the Soviet-built SA-2 surface-to-air missile showed up in the port of Haiphong. This two-stage radar-controlled rocket could travel at three times the speed of sound. Weighing as much as an SUV and measuring up to 35 feet long, the missile aptly earned the nickname Hand. Generally, the weasels preferred to fly ahead of the strike force to allow more time for identifying and hopefully destroying potential threats. Essentially, they were sent in to act as bodyguards to the strike force, a job that put them directly in the line of fire. On December 20th, the Weasels learned firsthand just how dangerous their job was. Two crews, led by John Pitchford and Bob Trier, were flying in typical formation ahead of a strike force of F-105s. 30 miles northwest of Hanoi, they picked up several enemy radar signals simultaneously. There was no time to react. Pitchford and Trier's plane was hit. Almost immediately, the hydraulics began to fail, and their F-100 nosed into an uncontrollable dive. While both men were able to bail out after considerable difficulty, they were immediately confronted by North Vietnamese militia upon landing. 
John and Bob didn't come back. John re was a prisoner of war for over seven years. Bob Trier, unfortunately, uh, what, what we have been able to piece together was killed uh, trying to escape capture. So uh, that was a really a bad day. From that day forward, the weasels changed their tactics. To mask their movements, they decided to fly as low as possible, just above treetop level. Just two days later, during a strike against the rail yard located on the notorious Red River, this tactic was put to the test. As soon as the lead weasel crew crossed into North Vietnam, they identified a SAM radar signal that was apparently searching for their flight. The crew immediately dove to mask their position. Periodically, the crew popped up from behind the hills to fix a new bearing on the enemy signal. Soon, a second SAM radar was identified, while the first had locked onto and was tracking their aircraft. The pilot approached a tiny village where he discovered a well-camouflaged radar control van and three missiles. The crew unleashed a barrage of 2.75-inch rockets and then strafed the village with 20-millimeter cannon fire. The pilot could see the North Vietnamese troops scattering from the site. The 20-millimeter walked right into one of the SAMs, causing a large explosion. With smoke billowing from the site, the rest of the flight struck with tremendous force, repeatedly unleashing barrages of rockets and cannon fire until the site had been destroyed and the radar signal was off the air. While the other SAM site furiously searched for the strike force, the weasels led the 105s down behind a hill and sped from the area. The mission had worked exactly as intended. The following day, the 7th Air Force publicized destruction of the SAM site to the world, but there was no mention of the wild weasels. Instead, the F-105s were credited with the kill. The project was still so secret that no one outside of the Pentagon and the men back at base knew about this new and unusual strike force. That was really the, the beginning of the, of the Wild Weasel program, and the, uh, it demonstrated that, yes, we could find them and destroy them. A secret program called the Wild Weasels, intended to counter surface-to-air missiles, has been deemed a success, but its fate is still uncertain. Two problems continue to plague the fledgling project. One was the speed of its aircraft, F-100. They were much slower than the F-105s they were supposed to protect. This forced the F-105s to fly at much slower speeds on approach to the target area posing unnecessary risks to the strike pilots. This also meant that the slower weasels were often left to fend for themselves on the way in and out of the target area. As soon as we came off the target, I noticed that we were alone, of course, because the 105s, the only thing we could see was them disappearing in the distance heading south. So that, thereabout came that expression, first in, last out had nothing to do with anything amounting to a great amount of courage. It just was that we didn't have enough uh, ghost stuff in our airplane to, to keep up with the 105s. Another problem had to do with the weasel's ordnance load. They just couldn't carry as much as the F-105s. While both carried 20-millimeter rounds and rockets, the 105s also carried conventional bombs. Also, to destroy the targets with their particular payload, the weasels had to head straight into the SAM site at an extremely low altitude. This put the airmen well within range of anti-aircraft and even small arms fire. In March of 66, the danger became a reality. A second weasel crew was downed and both men killed when their plane was struck from below. The loss served as a lesson to test new ordnance configurations. Cluster bomb units proved to be among the most promising for suppressing anti-aircraft fire and triggering explosions in the missiles. Each bomblet detonated just above the ground, 
sending thousands of steel pellets throughout the site. In addition to conventional bombs carried by the 105s, the weasels also tried dropping napalm canisters. However, the large tanks also required a low release altitude and created considerable drag on the already slow F-100s. In March of 1966, the Air Force found a solution. They replaced the plane. A new version of the F-105F would take over the weasel mission and it would carry a new missile, the radar-seeking AGM-45 Shrike. The arrival of these specially configured two-seat 105s finally provided the weasels with the speed needed to keep pace with strike aircraft and to evade enemy threats when necessary. However, it was the Shrike that had the biggest impact on the weasels' ability to suppress SAMs. We saw a big change in the, uh, in the way the radar operators on the ground, the uh, North Vietnamese and their Russian advisors, when, they would, when we would launch that Shrike, the radars would go down. When the radars went down, of course, that's when they'd lose their ability to, to launch the missile accurately. The Shrike was being developed as early as 1958 to counter the emerging threat posed by Soviet SAMs. The missile was rushed into service after a U-2 reconnaissance plane became the first confirmed victim by an SA-2 during the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. During a typical mission, the Weasels and all other strike aircraft joined up with a KC-135 tanker almost immediately after takeoff. The 105s were notorious fuel guzzlers, especially during combat operations when pilots frequently employed their afterburners. As a result, it was critical for crews to take on the maximum amount of fuel possible before heading north. Once refueled, the Weasels moved out ahead of the flight usually in a Y formation, with the strike aircraft trailing in the middle and some distance behind. For the duration of the mission, the safety of the entire flight rested in the hands of the electronic warfare officers, or BEARS. The real key to the weasel mission is the guy in the back seat, or the bear. The bear has been trained to understand and to operate in an electronic environment. Um, he knows the signals, he knows how to uh, identify and to react to the signals, which ones are good and which ones are bad, which ones are going to hurt us. Uh, he's very proficient in the use of the weapons, even though he didn't actually fire the weapons themselves, but that's irrelevant. He could say, shoot. In addition to monitoring radar threats on various scopes, the bear listened intently to hundreds of strange signals emitted by North Vietnamese radars. To his trained ear, each sound was quite distinct and contributed to a mental image of how radar operators on the ground were responding to the incoming strike force. It would have been impossible for the pilot alone to effectively digest the dense signal patterns over North Vietnam, but the bear could focus solely on pinpointing the location of enemy threats, instantly assign a priority to them, and recommend a course of action. We had uh, essentially a receiver that picked up the frequency of the SAM radar, we turned in the direction, we had needles that told us that we were going straight into it, and at that time we didn't have missiles that could go around the corner to hit the site. We had the Shrikes, which had to go straight in. And uh, once we lined up, we thought we had a kill, we fired the Shrike. The Shrike had a range of 5 to 10 miles and was designed to destroy the radar control antennae by riding the signal beam back to its source. When the missile struck,